thanks for joining us today on City Talk. I'm Maria Soreo, and joining us as he does each month is our mayor, Eric Alegria. Good morning. Yes, good morning, <laughs> and th thank you again for coming. And um, there's always so much to talk about going on in our city, and this month is definitely no exception to that. So Indeed. Uh, let's kind of jump in. Um, emergency Preparedness Month technically was September, but really it's so important to remember that, I think, for 12 months all year, and we kind of just wanted to go through some things. I know that uh, each week in September, staff provided tips on how our community can prepare for an emergency uh, with the recent earthquake that shocked our community. Did you feel the earthquake? I did. I was uh, was watching TV with the, the, the kids okay. and everyone felt it. Right. A couple of kids were scared. The other one said, I would like to have that happen again because they thought <laughs> it was kind of fun. Because they were sort of thinking it was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which I didn't, of course. But, I know. But certainly a stark reminder to all of us in the community that uh, these are the kinds of elements we have to consider yes. at all times, not just wildfires, but earthquakes as well. So, right. So sometimes I guess we need those sobering reminders. Yes, we do. So it's sort of appropriate that, that we're ending or rounding out September, which has been a, prepared, a National Preparedness Month. And of right. course, as you mentioned, there was themes of each week that we had. Week one was make a plan. Uh, week two was build a kit. Yes. Week three was low cost, no cost preparedness. Uh, which reminds us of texting to alert SB or alert South Bay. That's what that stands for. Right. To 888-777 just to make sure you get on the Everbridge uh, registration and you get the all the alerts for the South Bay region as a whole. So just lots of great technology out there that people there can is. take advantage to get alerts uh, in this day and age. And then finally, week four, this one's uh, certainly close to my heart, teach youth about preparedness. Absolutely, yes. And we know that they do that in schools, of course, but even at home to have that emergency kit, and they say to have one in your car, have one in your house, and we think, oh yeah, we're gonna do it, and then it doesn't happen. So it's so important that we get that done. We're all so susceptible, and sometimes we just often tend yes. to forget that we're quite spoiled. We have electricity all the time. Right, um, until we don't. Until we don't. Yes. Until we don't. So it's important to be aware of. and. I always like to highlight that in our city we have an emergency preparedness committee. Right. And um, boy, we are so well rounded on that committee um, in terms of the kinds of uh, committee members we have, the experiences that they have. Mm -hmm. And we're always at the cutting edge of preparedness. Um, but it's again, it's just one of those things that we often all take for granted until something happens. Yeah, so. absolutely. Having been through a couple of large earthquakes, I always have a flashlight right under my bed because. When the lights go out, and they're always they always seem to be early in the morning when you know all the lights are out and it's dark. So I learned that the hard way. But yeah, well, I, I always have that have. flashlight. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. So yeah, very important things to remember and uh, to keep our residents prepared in case of an emergency. The city offers brush clearing days in October, which is so very important. We always get that message from the fire department. Can you tell us more about how residents can take advantage of this? Oh, yes. Well, yes, as you mentioned, be aware. So starting in a week here, yep. uh, this coming weekend, and, can, and proceeding for the next four weekends, there's going to be brush, brush clearance throughout the city mm -hmm. and public spaces. And that's such a critical part of our preparedness for potentially for wildfires. And of course, California, we're no stranger to wildfires no. these days. It's it can be quite sad and quite tragic. So this work is really, really critical. And this is just another reminder. We sent a letter to our residents last year to say, harden your homes. Uh, make sure that you consider those couple hundred feet um, perimeter around your homes and mm -hmm. make sure that you're hardening your homes by doing your own brush, brush clearance on your private property in addition to the work that the city's doing. Right. So this is that, that time of year for us to, to remember to do all that, that great work. And I think people forget to do that too, where they sort of put it off. So yes, really critical reminder for sure. It's so critical to saving property and, and potentially lives. Yes, I mean, we like to live in this kind of an environment, but yeah, we definitely have to be careful there. So very good reminder. And I know that uh, of course they can always go to the RPV website if they want those dates again, because rpvca.gov, Full of information, so that's that's always good. all sorts of good stuff. Yes, always. And next up was the American Rescue Plan Act, and I know that it was a little complicated, but you guys discussed it at the city council meeting. Um, tell us more about the project and how the city will be embarking on it. Yeah, thank you. So mm -hmm. the American Rescue Plan Act, A R P A, or as it's also known, was signed into law uh, by President Biden in March of 2021, and it establishes a coronavirus 
local fiscal recovery fund. Uh, and this constitutes $350 billion in emergency for funding for state, local, and other uh, forms of government, tribal or territorial. Right. And uh, this is you know, such a unique part of American history, really. And to my knowledge, there, there hasn't been another time where uh, rescue funds have been deployed all the way to the municipal level. Mm -hmm. So we were fortunate uh, to, to have these funds to help us make up, uh, in our case, a little bit of the gap that we had experienced last year and partially this year from some of our, particularly sales tax and transit occupancy, occupancy tax have been our, our biggest impact as a result right. of the coronavirus. And so um, these funds do a couple of things. They support urgent COVID-19 response efforts. They potentially replace lost revenue mm -hmm. uh, and they support immediate economic stabilization efforts as well as, as, well as other purposes. What's, uh, you know, we're quite fortunate in this city to have received, uh, in our case, $9.9 .9 $9 million. Right. We've received $4.97 million of that recently, in recent months, and we'll get the other half next year. Okay. And at our recent council meeting, our uh, city staff made a proposal of various projects that um, the city council blessed to... Um, towards the efforts I mentioned in terms of replacing lost revenue and, and stabilizing the city itself. So I'll, let me highlight yeah, please. just some of the types of things that folks can expect to see as a result of these funds. Mm -hmm. I'll start with emergency preparedness since we just left off that topic because that is probably the most critical part of the use of these funds. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked last month about the, the wildfire monitoring cameras. Yes, absolutely. So very excited about that. Yeah. So these funds will be deployed. We just blessed the idea that these will be deployed for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Uh, as well as working with the other cities to develop a peninsula-wide evacuation plan, uh, replenishing some of our emergency supplies, as well as um, several other capital projects across the city, such as our Ladera Linda uh, Park and Community Center project, our pavement management program, mm -hmm. uh, particularly along Crenshaw Boulevard, uh, Abalone Cove sanitary sewer rehabilitation. These are the kinds of things mm -hmm. that we just kind of forget about or take for granted, yes. but these infrastructure projects are so essential and actually Absolutely. are a major cost to a city like ours as mm -hmm. a contract city. That's right. Other things are Western Avenue beautification, although we've started some of those efforts, mm -hmm. much work remains in that area. Uh, Eastview restroom and remodel, uh, restroom improvements at the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, mm -hmm. storm water drainage uh, improvement, park monument, signage so the list just kind of goes on and it on does. Um, we are fortunate and you know the, the the important thing I think for our residents to understand is there's some requirements related to these funds and Correct. it's that we have to have the projects identified by 2024 and we have to spend the money by 26 and there's a whole compliance process and so the reason this list is what it is is largely because these are already preconceived projects uh, some essential some perhaps will maybe not perceived as essential. However, uh, they were make, the dollars that we're receiving are making up for the, the funding that we would have received Elapid, from the transit right. occupancy tax. And those funds go directly into our capital projects anyway. So essentially, right. we're sort of uh, not only receiving um, enough funds to make up for the losses of our transit occupancy tax, We've, we're receiving a little bit more than we w than we have lost, mm -hmm. and these funds are, uh, as I outlined, going through uh, to continue our capital improvement projects throughout the city, along with our emergency projects as well. And also, I think the city staff just spends so much time really going through each project. Kind of talk about that. They they do a great job. So each year we have an annual capital improvement a review process that we go through. We have mm -hmm. a workshop and then several budget meetings. So it's good for the public to understand. Right. We don't come to these decisions lightly. No, not at all. Uh, and in fact, we have our finance advisory committee, our infrastructure management advisory committee, uh, both of which provide input during that process to help the city council work through where should we prioritize, what capital should we invest in, what should we put off for the following year, and right. those sorts of things. And um, the good news is because we've done that work from year to year, this list was kind of shovel ready, so to speak. Yeah, right. And um, again, because of the requirements of the funds that we're receiving for the recovery, um, we were able to just outline some of these capital projects, which were already planned. Right. And, um, and 
bless the idea that these are the things we're going to invest in going forward. Right. Even when we yeah. see like, you know, playground upkeep, residents just expect that to be done. Yes. And so it's it's important for the city. It is. It is. We have such a beautiful city, Absolutely. but it takes work and it maintenance does. to keep it <laughs> to keep as it beautiful up. as it is. Yes. And then our next topic was the legislative updates. The city's been following legislative action from the state capitol. Uh, during this session, they kept the community informed through the legislative corner, which is found on the city's website on potential bills becoming laws. What can you tell us um, and the community regarding legislative bills and the impact our city uh, that the governor has signed? So recently, so I, I, we've talked a little bit in this show previously about yes. some of the housing-related legislation right. that was proposed. Mm -hmm. uh, so the update up to this point is that there were two recent bills that we've been following closely that the city opposed, uh, which were SB9, so mm -hmm. Senate Bill 9 and Senate Bill 10. Correct. SB9 will allow developers to build up to four housing units on a single parcel in residential neighborhoods traditionally zoned for single-family homes. Mm -hmm and SB 10 will allow cities to upzone by ordinance for up to 10 units in a transit-rich corridor. Um, this, the latter, so SB 10, doesn't, because we don't have too many transit-rich corridors, and there's a definition for what that means, and typically, because of the frequency of our bus stops, we don't quite trigger that uh, definition. Okay. So the, the more applicable, I think, to our city here on the peninsula is SB 9. Right. And so, um, Governor Newsom did recently sign both of these bills into law. We have been following them closely. Um, we're, there's, now that they've been passed, we're seeking you know, to continue to deepen our understanding of uh, all aspects of these laws and how we're going to move forward and working, you know, working with these laws. And um, the city attorney's office currently is working through a review a legal and a legal analysis of the impacts of both of these bills to our city okay and so we'll get more information that we'll see in city uh, future city council meetings uh, but we'll you know so stay tuned i think on okay. that and as you mentioned the legislative corner of our city website is just fantastic full of information our staff has done a great job uh our, the work in sacramento is constantly evolving proposal in terms of legislation is constantly evolving so i really encourage our public to stay in tune with what's happening and uh, that's a good way of doing that right and you know I think our community also is really so locked into what's going on and they do come to the City Council meetings as mm -hmm. you and I have talked about and I think it's just good to add that that this council is really concerned and wants to hear from the community yes. about different uh, different aspects of what's going on and things that are happening and that you do listen you do listen to mm -hmm. residents when they have issues I think that sometimes that gets a little bit lost but I just kind of address that because I think it's an important thing to remind everyone absolutely I, I think thank you for highlighting that Maria and I uh, I'll speak for my, you know, four yeah. colleagues as well, and mm -hmm. certainly prior counsel that I had the pleasure of working with also. Um, and knowing these individuals, even when we disagree on topics, right. they're, they, there's, uh, each one of us takes such great pride in the work that we do. And mm -hmm. uh, the work we do requires uh, gathering a lot of information, having a lot of conversations, talking to a lot of people. So oftentimes I think when people see the council meetings themselves, they sort of perceive that that's, that's, it. that's really the breadth of the public dialogue on a particular topic. And in reality, that's not nearly the, yeah, right. the breadth of the topic. There's a lot of work behind the scenes that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, talking to the public and listening to the public is a big, big part of that. So, And yeah, I know I people you email that. you as well. And so it's really not just the meeting time. No, no absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> there's a lot more for sure. No, there's a lot more to it. And, and actually on that note, you know, one of the pieces of legislation, uh, Assembly Bill 361, that we did support mm -hmm. uh, and will allow cities to continue utilizing teleconferencing for open and public meetings under declared states of emergency. We, we have we really have supported this bill because uh, we've seen great uptick even during a difficult time during the pandemic and our hybrid meetings and yes. our participation in our hybrid meetings, which has been really, really nice to see. I think mm -hmm. we're all very fearful in the very beginning of the pandemic that right. we would lose a sense of the pulse of the community because they weren't as engaged or involved just because people couldn't come to meetings in person. So AB 361, you know, allows 
for us to continue these, uh, the hybrid approach to, to our meetings, which has been great. It has, and I think people are even more involved to a point because they wanted to make sure they had the latest information. Yes. Yeah, Which absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so engage. So those of yeah. you like me who have children and yeah. you know your your jobs, it's and it's difficult to come to a council meeting. And sometimes I know we go into the wee hours of the evening, and yes. it's difficult for folks. You can record messages and get them absolutely um, played during yeah. the specific topic of your interest. Uh, you can come to meetings still, of course, or you can. Uh, stand by and, and you can zoom into our meetings as well. Right, or if you miss it, you can watch it on our PV TV. Uh, that's right. <laughs> so, so many ways to, to stay engaged. To get caught up, absolutely. Um, another topic of conversation was the coyote management. I know there's been so many sightings this year of coyotes. Can you tell us where the city is with addressing that situation? Yeah, thank, thank you. So, mm -hmm. we, the city council has become increasingly concerned, I would say, over the last several months as we've gotten more and more reports from community members about more aggressive behavior from coyotes. Presence in, presence in neighborhoods as well as um, attacks on pets. Uh, this has become, my perception is has become a much more frequent occurrence, certainly in my time over the last four years on council. And so we uh, agendized in July, the city council, a look at the coyote management plan. We've already had a very good right. coyote management plan that mm -hmm. in fact many other cities reach out to us to discuss and emulate. Um, so we feel like we're, we're doing some great work in this area. However, we felt like it was time to look at to, an enhanced enhancements to that plan, which you know call for uh, increased trapping of, uh, and the identification of uh, selective trapping of, of aggressive coyotes. Right. So that's a big component of it. And so really we looked at our coyote management plan. I'd say we supplemented it with some new language sort of tighten it up to make sure that when we do have these reports, we can react and respond as quickly as possible. And although um, we currently contract with the county, Los Angeles County Agricultural Commissioner um, for coyote trapping services, we know we need additional help. And therefore, in uh, this last council meeting, we did um, approve the contract uh, for private trapping services to augment those county services. And okay. that's really the intention of it, bringing in a little bit of additional help to help us out and make sure that we're responding as, as quickly as possible. And then I want to highlight, of course, the public education component, Absolutely. which we want to continue to emphasize. I mean, the goal is still to be able to live, you know, uh, in this ecosystem with coyotes. Right. Um, and so a big part of that is educating the public. So we've approved a sort of single newsletter. We have our normal quarterly newsletter, but a single newsletter to sort of uh, help us all brushing up on public education as it relates to uh, how we live with coyotes. Yes, and, and also where to go and what to do when you have trouble with coyotes as well, because I know that's that's been a challenge. And then we've uh, decided that we want to look back, take another look at the uh, the penalties and citations for feeding coyotes. So yeah. anyone who listens to this show, please things. don't feed coyotes. Um, as um, one of the representatives from State and Wildlife uh, uh, who came out to our last council meeting eloquently said, Mother Nature knows how to sort of balance itself out. Yes, it really so does. So when we add or introduce new food that wouldn't have typically been available to coyotes, that's when you have, start to have trouble with the ecosystem. Right. Um, so that's a big part of it too. So hopefully folks are listening to this and they'll get this information from us. And and also if you know of people that are doing it, um, it's not the, my favorite thing to say, but yeah. please report to the city because we do need to get out there and talk to those individuals, educate them and potentially cite them. Yeah, I think it's a lack of information. So it's very helpful, of course. Yes. Um, an ongoing project is the Ladera Linda Park and Community Center. Um, what transpired in the, the last discussion that you had at the meeting? Thank you. So this has been a you know ongoing, yes. ongoing process, of course, of several components related to this project earlier in the year. The design and the conditions of approval were approved by the city council, uh, as well as a um, conceptual funding plan okay. for the project. So uh, what happened last week's council meeting was related to the uh, security plan. So the, you know, the city council has absolutely heard the feedback from the adjacent community as well as other HOAs around that area. Mm -hmm. We recognize kind of it's a unique spot. It's isolated and therefore we want to have real state-of-the-art, 
you know, up-to-date security plan to make sure that uh, when it's not open to the public that it's well protected. Of course. And so um, the council meeting discussed that and there were several components to the proposed security plan that council had a chance to review, react to, and discuss, such as uh, use of cameras, mm -hmm. um, lighting uh, was something, although it wasn't part of the topic per se that night, it was discussed in the context of the broader security plan discussion. Uh, you know, whether to have glass sensors or shutters or these type of things to protect the building itself. Right. Um, these were all sort of points of discussion for that evening. I thought it was a great discussion. I think the uh, consultant we hired did a nice job with staff. Um, there was, you know, several cameras, lots of glass sensors, lots of um, badge type entryway doors access into this building. So there was a great plan, uh, but we did hear from the community you know, adjacent to it, or Daryl Linda HOA, that there were concerns related to uh, lighting and privacy as it relates to the Correct. use of cameras. Yes. And, um, you know, issues with uh, height of fence lines and things like that. And so uh, we ultimately agreed as a council to continue the item to make sure that we gave, um, you know, we have more chance to work through those remaining issues. Uh, I think there's an opportunity to, to largely keep the security plan that was presented intact, right? Uh, but perhaps make it a little bit more modest in areas that you know are affecting the the neighborhood, um, and it's understandable. Uh, yeah. You know, you want to have cameras, but you also want to make sure they're not pointing at people's homes. Exactly. Uh, you want to have uh, cameras at a certain height. This was one of the issues that evening. It was proposed to put cameras at um, 16 feet, mm -hmm. which would be a modification to the current conditions. But as some of the residents brought to our attention, you know, this certainly could affect their line of sight and their views. Right. And so we need to be sensitive to all that and work through it. And I, I believe and have total confidence that the next couple of weeks we'll do so. You'll and, get there. And expect that to return to council in a couple of weeks. And we'll have a good security plan good. that also balances out, you know, impacts to the neighborhood. A lot of things to consider, that's for sure. Yes. And then recently, our local park rangers had the opportunity to attend a class about rattlesnake safety, and RPD TV was there. And I have to tell you, I learned more about rattlesnakes in that bit of time than I ever knew about. So, fun question for you today. Um, how many times a year, Mayor, does a rattlesnake eat? So, I, I, I luckily I had a chance to look this up before <clears throat> you asked the question, or I would have. I would have completely gotten this wrong, but I guess it's twice a year. Twice a year. They eat gophers and rats and things like that. Again, we talk about the ecosystem. We learned so much because rattlesnakes basically will camouflage themselves in areas, unfortunately, that hikers are in. Sometimes you're walking your dog, and if you step on it, that's when it strikes and bites. And yes. really, that's kind of where the trouble begins. But a lot of people also will try to grab them and... That's why this show is going to be so full of great information because the rangers really learn how to um, move the snakes into better areas. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they venture into backyards and things like that. And so you can actually call people that will come and, you know, help you to remove mm -hmm. them and not really a good idea to remove them yourself. I, I would agree. I would but not a advise. Lot of, you know, but a lot of people try. Yes. So, and it, it's just so interesting that there, you know, so many people are affected by that in our neighborhoods. Yes, yeah, rattlesnakes are, as you said, a big part of the ecosystem. They, and they are. They do do some great work for us they as do. it relates to, you know, rodent mm -hmm. control and that sort of thing. Yes. Um, and as you noted, I think it's important for the public to just understand that they're not, yeah. it's not typical behavior for them to attack or go out of their way to attack humans. Correct. They're more reacting to the protection of their environment, right. protection of their space. So it's good for us to just be aware of yes. where they are at all times. Yeah, for absolutely, for sure. And. It's that time of the year when the goons and the goblins come out. I can't believe it. I know. I know. Are your kids ready for Halloween this oh, year? Oh, everyone's ready. They already have their costumes, of actually. Course. I mean, we're not Always. even out of September yet. Yes. Everyone's got their costumes and they're ready. Right. And yeah. I know the city does trunk or treat every year, which is so much fun. I remember the first time I saw it and all the decorated trunks. And it's really a huge hit. Tell us more about that. Oh, it's a great event. Mm -hmm. I've gone in prior years with my kids. Yeah. Uh, having all those cars backed up with all these great goodies yeah. and gift bags and those sorts of things for kids. So those of you who have kids in the community, please, please come, out. come out, enjoy. It's just a great community event. 
And actually, it works rather well in, in you know, COVID times, I would say, in the sense that so. there's spread out. It's very safe. Yes. Uh, there's activities for the kids to enjoy as well. And I think you've got all the information yes, on Yes, Saturday, October 23rd from 1 to 4. So you can yeah. still trick-or-treat on Halloween. Come, so. come out and enjoy. Absolutely. And anything else you would like to add before we go? Uh, just a big thank you to our city uh, staff, my colleagues on the council. Uh, uh, we, we really, it's a labor of love, the work that we do for our city and for our community. Absolutely. Uh, but we really do appreciate all the work that uh, we get to do with city staff. It's a pleasure to work with RPV TV. So. Well, it's a pleasure to work with you as well. Thank you so much for being with us today. And thank you all so much for watching. I'm Maria Sorreo, and we'll see you next time on City Talk.